Thank you all for coming and welcome to Muse. I hope you found everything you needed. Uh, if you need some drinks, it's over there. Uh, my name is Jan. I will not be the main speaker here. There is Peter and Thomas who we will be talking to you today. And uh, I hope you enjoy, uh, enjoy uh, your stay in our offices and I hope you enjoy, might enjoy the, the talks. And of course, to all together, you can follow us on Twitter and you can read something about us in, on the GitHub. Alright, so I'd like to welcome the first speaker, which is uh, Peter. And he's going to answer in his first talk, okay? So, but we, we heard it yesterday, it's pretty good. <laughs> Alright, enjoy. Oh, and very important, uh, some of you already saw the rooftop terrace, right? It's good. So we're gonna have some uh, networking up there with pizza and beer after all, so we don't make any plans. <laughs> okay, hello everybody. Uh, my topic is named Functional Sectors for Redux, you probably know that. Uh, my name is Peter Bambushek. I work uh, here at Muse for more than five years now, and uh, the position is now called Head of Frontend, but yeah, it's pretty much like the frontend development only. I have a Twitter, but I don't use it that much. Uh, we also have recently started developers blog, so you might find some articles there, and hopefully someday also this topic turned into article, because they forced me to write about it. Uh, and I'm procrastinating, so yeah. uh, this should be a lightning talk. So I will probably not have that much time to go like into proper details. Uh, I will tell you a little bit more about what are selectors. In case you don't know, like uh, our view about it is that they either pull data from state, or that they transform it or derive some some other properties from it. Uh, the essential part for us is that they create like interface and decouple the state shape from, from view, uh, from UI, from, from React components, from actions, wherever we need the state. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's the idea behind selectors for us. How to write selectors? Well, you probably know that. Uh, there are some options like vanilla JavaScript. There's a very nice rest select library. But what I want to talk about is uh, what we evolved a little bit here uh, in our core base, and it's a little bit more functional approach. So I have some prerequisites. I assume that you at least know a little bit about functional programming, uh, mainly functional compositions and carrying. If you don't know, uh, I will also provide like some, let's say, introductions to, to the functions that I need to use. Uh, but I don't have like probably enough time to go into detail, so maybe like you can study it later and it will make more sense. Uh, I will use some utility functions. I, I will provide like a close enough vanilla vanilla uh, definitions for them. Uh, but uh, preferably, if you want to program it, uh, I suggest you use like Lodash FP or Ramda or any similar thing. Uh, we use Lodash FP, so yeah. So let's get started. Uh, the easiest selectors that we can imagine uh, are getters. And they are simply about getting some some uh, some part of the state and providing access to it without actually knowing about what the state shape is. So let's imagine we have state like this, and we would like to write selectors, let's say for get image base rule or 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 get configuration as a whole. Well, for that we can use uh, get function, uh, which is pretty simple. It takes it takes part, it takes object, and it provides back the value. Uh, in Ramda it's called prop, in Lodash it's called get like this. So with that we can create get configuration selector. That's pretty easy. Uh, well, how we can do get image based role without repeating ourselves? Uh, the idea is simple. We will use function composition. Uh, if you don't know about function composition, the important part is like this. If you provide functions, let's say two functions f and g, the first is called function g with arguments of the function, and the result of g is called uh, is provided as argument as input to f function. So, with example, 
we can write get image base role like this. You compose, you use the get configuration as entry point, as the G function. Result of it is, is this. And from that, you just use the get and you get image base role. So yeah, that's easy. Uh, we can also like create uh, some some uh, more derived selectors already. We can create like uh, predicates for like querying whether the environment is is is, is production or is it develop, and yeah, you can start with this. Uh, I used this equal function that comes from Modash. In Ramda, it's called equals. Uh, yeah, that's that's our getter strike. Pretty simple thing, but you probably can't get like uh, you can probably create that much of selectors with just like one input. Yeah. You probably need more than one selectors to actually get something done, uh, or like you probably want to derive from multiple sources. So we can get to next step, which is uh, something I, I called converge pattern based on how 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 the function we will use is named the Ramda. Uh, Let's say we have this state as an example. We have some user stored, and we have somewhere stored to get current user ID, and we would write a we would like to write a selector that will give us the current user, let's say name or, or current user as a whole. So how how do it? Like how to do it? Well, we can start with getters for these for these values. That's that's pretty easy. We already know that. Then there is some something we will need to do get current user and if you get uh, if you get get current user we can obviously like compose it to to use it and like uh, write a get current user name like this so how to do the get current user thing well for that we will use function that's called over and uh, this comes from lodash uh, in ramda i think i, I haven't find like direct equivalent in ramda i'm not sure there is there is one that works with lenses that is a little bit different uh, so, so in Lodash you can find this function, or you can go with vanilla. It's pretty like straightforward. The thing that it does is takes it takes array of functions, and then it uh, returns function that you can provide arguments to it. And every function in that array is called with those arguments, and you get back an array of of the results. So, if we define our input selectors like this, get current user, idea get user, and then we can call it with the state we get array with like first get current user ID and then the get user get users part of the shape uh, of the state so with this uh, we now uh, oh yeah the second second part we need is is uh, how to actually turn this to, to the result into 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 uh, like uh, into what we want the, the get car uh, current user selector so for that uh, we can use an apply function, which is pretty pretty straightforward. It does the same thing as as, as uh, JavaScript uh, apply call pattern in, on functions does. It takes uh, it it allows you to call a function with an array of arguments. So you provide a function first, then you provide an array of arguments, and then you call 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 the function. Uh, yeah. So if we have the input selectors like this, we can use apply use our already known get function and if you return the input uh, you get this now there's a li like little little bit uh, thing that I have to mention this will not work with the get as I defined it because the get uh, is carried so if you use get from Lodash or, or prop from Ramda it will work uh, but yeah that's that's the idea how to how to turn it into 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 function in the result that we want so with that, uh, we can actually build our current user selector like this. We already we already knew. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, we already have have uh, we know how to compose things. We just use over uh, to get our inputs, and then the result are turned like they are they are thrown into this function, and you will get this when you call it the state. And uh, that's pretty much a uh, very common pattern how to, how to write uh, selectors. It's very similar to how, how create selector to, uh, utility uh, works in, in, in rest select. Uh, you can provide multiple, multiple input selectors, and then you have some function that turns 
the results into, into something else that you want. Uh, so because it's quite common, we can define a utility for this. Uh, in Ramda, it's actually a part of the library. It's called Converge, so I borrowed the name. In Lodash, there is a way how to do it. I provide the link, so maybe you can check it later. Uh, so yeah, it's pretty much it. We will just simplify our, 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 our process here that we will take the function for converging and then we can get the, uh, the we provide the functions as, as like uh, input selectors here. So if I would have to rewrite it, this is how I would do it. Like you have a converge get and just this. So you can simplify, you don't have to repeat yourself. Uh, yeah, that was it. Uh, so the next part is, the next question is how we actually can turn this into more common selectors. And the way how to do it is that uh, we will allow ourselves to provide arguments to selectors. So like the final example, let's say that uh, you have a state and, and you, have, you have users and you would like to write a selector that can give you, uh, get you any user. So you don't have to have like one, one get user selector and you don't have to repeat yourself. Uh, so the idea is, the fir first, first question is how we will call it or how we will use it. Uh, that's pretty easy. We can just add one more argument on top of the state. And this is our idea how it should be the result. Uh, next question is how to, how to do it actually. So uh, we already know how to, how to do it with current uh, user. ID when it's stored in a state. So we, s we keep this pattern, it's pretty much the same. We will still need to, to pull in to get the users, but we will probably need something different here to get uh, our ID, to use it as, as argument to get. Uh, so for that, we will can use simple simple function that will just take the second argument of, of uh, second argument of, uh, from, from, the, like, from the two that's called with and it will take also prop name, which is basically like just the key into object. It's pretty much the same as a get. So we can obviously use get to define it too. We will just need like one more function that's called uh, flip that just reverse the order of the, of the, of the arguments. And with this thing, it's easy to actually access the user ID. So with that under our tool belt, we can write very common get user selector and use it like this. Uh, and with this, we can, this is actually like pretty nice pattern because then we can start, uh, uh, sorry, oh yeah, we can obviously like, uh, then like use this selector to still compose it and create like get username selector and still get you know, provide, if you provide the user ID, you get, you get, you get it scoped to, to the user and you get the username. And yeah, so this one, this is pretty reusable. And the nice way how to use it and how we actually quite often use it is that if you have a very common uh, React component, uh, if you connect it, uh, this, is, this is connect from React Redux. The React Redux provides you with the props as a second argument if, if you want it. So you can pass it to get username and you probably get the idea that you can then use it like this, wherever you get the user ID, but yeah, that's, that's a different story. So this make it a little bit more reusable. Uh, final part of, 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 this, of this story is uh, memoization because you probably, if, if you know that the rest select by default, uh, memoize the results. So, so to make it at least equal to, to the solution of, of rest select, we have to talk a little bit about memoization. Uh, memoization on itself is quite uh, like, let's say like a big topic. Uh, so there are a lot of different libraries that solve just the memoization. I don't want to go there, but let's say you already have selected your memoization library uh, and you have memoization function that if you give it any function, it will give you a memoized function and it will, it will memoize whatever, whatever, how, whatever the <coughs> algorithm and choose, it's up to that. You can just simply put it in the converger pattern that I like, uh, proposed previously and it will give you Memoized, memoized converge, yeah. And probably I went over, over <coughs> the time of, 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 of my lightning talk, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. So a little bit summary that what I went through, and yeah, any questions? Yes? I'd like to ask 
to ask you know, uh, about adoption of this uh, uh, from people who doesn't know, you know how to basically see you know, the patterns in the functional composition? Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, I can tell you how we adopt it a little bit. We still use Reselect uh -huh. uh, heavily. Uh, what we did is that we gradually played with the, with the functions. So we get there, we, we started with gets, we started a little bit with the compose. I think we started with compose, like you might not compose from, from uh, Redux itself, if you like try to compose connect, maybe with some high order components and to provide. Yeah, so we gradually got this to these patterns and then we, you know, we, we figure out how to do the over thing, to actually pull in <coughs> multiple arguments. And, and uh, well, from that, you know, it was step by step. Uh, if you want to start with that, uh, like uh, there's a quite nice uh, thing that you can do, for example, with the, with the selectors. If you, if you want to play with it, maybe like you know you have this big function and you don't, you are unsure how to do it. There's an easy thing that you can do: just insert the function between between the composed functions and just do like console log of the arguments. Okay. And it's nice. Yeah, maybe my question was a little bit different, uh, but thank you for answering. You know <laughs> this part. Uh, I was asking like about people. You know how how can any like someone who is a new joiner who doesn't really you know, have the mental switch to mm -hmm. these uh, functional principles, you know, how are people able to adopt, you know, this kind of uh, patterns? Oh, well, I would probably start with the basic of the functional programming. Like, uh, the, the, the thing that I mentioned in prerequisite is like that you uh, get a little bit what the functional composition is about, about the cutting thing, which is, uh, which is pretty much about uh, turning the functions into functions that can ac like accept one argument after uh, like, the, uh, yeah, like you know I know like the concepts you know like how, what carrying means you know what is mm -hmm. functional application etc but like kind of I don't see you know in the code I, I, I look at it and it just messed with my head you know I just don't see you know what's going on there right? uh -huh. so maybe we can uh, we can talk about it you know after after the talk yeah. this, this is like uh, too long yeah I, I actually like I, I unfortunately I I have to leave after this <laughs> talk. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like if I, I guess, like uh, you know, if you look up uh, for other 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 right. people with these t-shirts as I have, so they they will be able. Like you can you can maybe talk with Lin. He's quite adopter of of Lodash, Lin, <laughs> and propagator propagator of Ramda. Okay. So maybe he can hook you up, uh, like a little bit into our details, what how how we use it, how we adopt it. Yeah, anyways, thank you for this like. Yeah. Mm hmm. I wonder why you decided to go with uh, with this approach over the selectors, the reselect. Like uh huh. Well, uh, as I told, like we started with selectors and reselect. Uh, uh, we got that gradually. I guess it's about that we kind of like the functional programming approach. Like even guys from backend like it. We, we like to play with it. Uh, you know, it kind of like uh, feels that uh, the function composition is quite a natural thing when you talk about the selectors because you have like, you know, <coughs> you, get, you, you create them like level by level and you get deeper and deeper and you like uh, do derive data from the more basic data. So it was, it was kind of like, it fit, it fit it nicely. So, yeah. Uh, but so, so are you able, in this pattern, are you able to do something like, I don't know, in reselect when you have like this multiple, let's say, branching selectors, they all converge into one final value. Mm -hmm. Like each each step of the way is memoized. So if if some branch don't need to be computed, it does, it's done. Mm -hmm. so are you able to achieve this pattern as well? Oh, uh, yeah, that's that's a good question. Like uh, uh, I, I talked a little bit about the memoization. Uh, <coughs> if, 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 you, if you think about it, uh, like the way how reselect uh, selectors are memoized is that they take uh, all the all the input selectors, they produce some result, and if the result is unchanged, they give you the previous previous result. But uh, so that's that's uh, what you can possibly do with the with the memoized converge. I show you. If you would ask about the selectors on path, uh, I know maybe this unpopular opinion, but I would say that you probably don't need memoization there. If you think about it, if it's just a getter that uh, gets part of the state from somewhere, or if it's a getter that takes it from a like memoized yeah. cache somewhere, mm -hmm. it's still getting you know value from memory, so yeah. you probably don't save anything. So yeah, but if if uh, yeah, that's the that's like another 
Another th thing is that uh, we still use the reselect where we probably need memoization and we are unsure like, you know, this, this is not well adopted. This memoized converge is actually not we, something we used. This is something I went into for this talk just. So when we need uh, memoization, we still use the, to create a select from the select. Thank you. Ah, thank you for the question. All right, thanks, Peter. Yeah. Thank you. So, so Pete, Peter, was, uh, Peter was testing yesterday on our front end weekly, and I asked the other guys if this presentation would be helpful before they started working in news, and apparently, yes. So it's great that you are all here now. <laughs> right, Thomas, you ready? So you can, you're off, you're leaving. Yeah, I'm leaving, sorry guys. <laughs> so you'll miss the pizza. Yeah. So Thomas came all the way for, from Munich, right? So are people getting ready for Oktoberfest or it's too early? It's throughout the whole day, uh, throughout the whole year we're getting <laughs> ready. Yeah. Is the training is the whole year. Is the year fest? Of course, yeah. All right, yeah. so enjoy Thomas' talk. <laughs> um, a long time ago, people used uh, wood, Flintstones, and Tinder, not the app, but real Tinder, in order to create and control fires. But that is totally 1 million BC, and today we are going to create fires with ClojureScript. And instead of uh, wood, fl uh, Flintstones, and Tinder, we are going to use uh, Newton's laws of motion, particle systems, and additive blending. But before we start, let me uh, introduce myself. My name is Thomas. I'm a software developer working for Comsisto Reply. We're a Munich-based company. And um, on my day job, I'm transforming business processes into applications. Uh, but at some point, about a year ago, I thought maybe there's uh, a bit more I can do with programming than just to transform business processes. And um, I was at an exhibition in Munich. The exhibition was called the art of illusion and there was a little boy who was uh, really really scared and he was standing in the exhibition hall and he was standing on some wooden planks and he could barely move because he was just too scared and the reason for that was that he was wearing uh, virtual reality goggles and in his reality this wooden plank was about 100 meters above the ground pointing out of a skyscraper and well he just stood there shocked and he wasn't the only one. So there were also adults who couldn't move after they put on the VR goggles and they totally get into this reality. And I was sitting there in line waiting to be the next one and thought, well, maybe I could be the one scaring all those people or creating experiences for them. And uh, shortly after that, I started reading um, a book which is called The Nature of Code. Uh, the Nature of Code is about um, physics and uh, programming combined together. I'm currently at chapter 6 of 10, so I'm not finished yet, but I will definitely this year. And I hope that chapter 6 of 10 is enough to get a little presentation about what I learned so far. And yeah, but um, before, we, before we start with uh, creating fires, uh, this talk is not only about fires, but it's also about closure. And uh, closure is probably uh, currently, uh, my most favorite programming language, and there are three certain concepts which are combined together in Clojure, and that is, I think it's pretty unique to combine these three concepts. And the first one is the dynamic nature of Clojure. And with dynamic, I mean two different things. On the one, uh, on the one side, um, I mean a dynamic type system. I guess everyone here has worked with JavaScript and have worked with a dynamic type system. And personally, I don't really like working with uh, static types. So for me, working with static types feels like working with handcuffs. And in the Clojure community, there's the saying that if you're working with Clojure, you're running with scissors. And that's just, I think that's much better than working with handcuffs. Um, uh, but Clojure is not only dynamic with regards to the type system. Uh, Clojure is also dynamic with regards to the way you work with the, with the program. So while you start your program, you are able to change uh, all the time small parts of your program, change some functions, change some uh, calls, and you basically interact with your program. We will see that when we start coding our fire. Um, yeah, and this is basically the dynamic part of Clojure. And the second part is the uh, functional part of uh, Clojure. And uh, as far as I know, there is not this one definition of what a functional programming really is. Uh, for me personally, it means that 
your language helps you to have as little state as possible. And having as little state as possible usually results in having as little bugs as possible. Um, because you have a clear control flow where things start and where things end and you don't mutate <coughs> things in between. And this is a little bit the counterpart of this running of, with scissors world um, of the dynamic programming and the functional world where you keep things in a flow all the time. And I think for that reason, closure really works well because these two balance each out. The third uh, concept of closure is that it's a Lisp language. And usually when I try to solve people on closure, they're like, okay, it's dynamic and it's functional and it's pretty cool. And then I say, well, it's also a Lisp. And then there are two different reactions. So either people say, so I never heard what a Lisp is, or they say, you cannot work with a Lisp. So you cannot read that and it's impossible for everyone to understand what is happening in a Lisp language. And I think that this is really sad. So I want to share some love for Lisp languages. <laughs> and um, before doing that, let me quickly define what Lisp languages actually are. So there are three large families of programming, family, of programming languages. The first one are C programming languages or programming, programming languages based on C language. Uh, these are all the popular ones. So C itself, C++, JavaScript, C Sharp, probably everyone here have worked with uh, uh, with a C language. Uh, the second one are the ML languages. These are, these are languages like uh, Haskell, uh, PureScript, or Elm. I think these are the most beautiful languages, but unfortunately they're statically typed. So I stick with the last category, which are the Lisp languages. And the Lisp languages are languages like Clojure, of course, or Scheme, or uh, Common Lisp. And uh, the cool thing about Lisp languages it, is that they are really, really simple. So I will now just spend about three minutes in order to explain to you all the syntax you have to know to write a Lisp language. And uh, we open our first file. So we see a call for a namespace here, which is closure specific and is really important for us now, but we're in the directory discovery of fire in the file example. And in order to write Lisp code, of course, you start with parentheses. And the next thing you do is writing the function that you want to use, in our case, an addition. And after that, you're just providing parameters <coughs> and you uh, put some spaces in there. Uh, it, actually, it doesn't get any more complex than this. If you want to do more complex things, you can like nest more parentheses, so you can put in a multiplication in here. But that's all the syntax that you need in order to program anything with list that you want to do. Uh, thanks to the dynamic nature of Clojure, I'm even able to run this code in my editor. So I can just press, um, press some shortcut and then this code gets uh, evaluated in my editor. And I can also just move to a certain uh, bracket in there and just evaluate parts of my program. So now only the multiplication was evaluated. And from any point in my code, I can just evaluate the outermost parentheses. Um, there are a couple of more advantages when working uh, with Lisp languages, and one of them is stru structural editing. So to a certain extent, my editor is able to understand what is a working program and what is not a working program without any compilation. So for instance, if I would remove these parentheses, then my program would not be any valid program anymore. And if I try to do so in my editor, so I press my delete button now, it just won't delete the parentheses, it just jumps over it. And only when I hit something, which is something that I can delete because it won't destroy the program, it will delete it. And I can still run my program and it will still work. And uh, only if there's nothing left, my, my editor allows me to delete the parentheses and then I can rerun my program. Um, I can also do things like, uh, so here's a five outside um, in my edition and I can use a shortcut in order to move it inside my multiplication or outside of my multiplication. And the difference with normal programming for me is like in normal programming, you feel, it feels like you're manipulating a string. And in the end, you hope that you have a valid program. Maybe your compiler yells at you. And here, we're really working with a data structure. And we're applying some functions to this data structure. And it's basically not uh, possible or much harder to create something which is uncompiled. And this is something that I really like. It takes some time to get used to it. But after you're used to it, you really uh, don't want to work with any other language anymore, at least for me. But let's get back on track and stop talking about Lisps. Because what we actually want to do is draw something on the screen. And we will do so by using processing. 
processing is almost uh, 20 years old. It is based on uh, Java and it is a programming language um, for creating visualizations. All the visualizations are usually called sketches in processing, so I will always say uh, sketches and you can think of visualizations. Uh, processing was intended for designers, students and artists, so it's a pretty easy language and it's also very good for me as being a pretty lazy developer, so it's really easy to learn and uh, not hard to understand. Uh, processing provides some wrappers for any other language, for instance, processing for JavaScript, processing for Python, and of course, processing for Clojure, which is called Quill. And Quill has probably the nicest logo of all the open source libraries I've ever seen. And uh, let's start with a deep dive of the uh, Quill library. Uh, so in order to draw something on the screen, the first thing that we need is uh, a host diff. So if you ever work with React or something like that, you're familiar with this concept, we need to have some element on a page which we can s where we can start our visualization. In my case, uh, I, I added some styling so we can already see where the host diff is. And now let's take a look uh, at the corresponding code of that. Okay. Uh, so once more, we have a namespace here. So we are in the folder discovery of fire, sketches, in the file name quill. And we have two imports here. So we import in quill.core, which is just a quill library. And we give it an alias, so, uh, which is q. So I just have to type q and not quill.core all the time if I want to access some function of quill.core. And we're also importing quill.middleware, which we are going to use later. Uh, I'm already making a function call to quill. I'm using the dev sketch function and uh, I'm providing quill dash sketch to the dev sketch function. And this diff here has the ID quill dash sketch. So this is how these two are connected. So I added my diff here with an ID and here I provided the same ID. The next thing which we need to do, uh, to do in order to use a quill sketch is to provide a setup function. So let's learn how to write a function in Clojure. Uh, we start with parentheses and then we use a function which is called uh, defin, which means define function. After that, we provide a name of the function and an empty parameter list. Then we can start with the body of the function. And in our case, we will use uh, quill's ellipse method in order to draw an ellipse on the screen. And the ellipse is also the only thing that we need in order to create a fire in the end. Uh, the ellipse expects an X parameter, a Y parameter, a width, and the height. And if I rerun my sketch, my ellipse will get drawn to the screen. Oh, I of course need to add my setup method to my sketch. So I need to provide a key setup and then the name of my function, which is setup. And now if I run my code, we'll see an ellipse on the screen. And if I change anything about my setup function and rerun my sketch, the um, circle will change its position. Setup is only used uh, once on the startup and it's usually not called, uh, it's not used to draw something on the screen. That's uh, where the draw function is used to. And uh, we will just add it the same way as we added the setup function, saying we wanted to have a draw function, which is called draw. Then we add a new function, just copy over the ellipse from the setup and use it in a draw function. And if you read on the sketch, it looks like nothing changed. So it was pretty boring. Um, but one thing that changed is that the frame uh, function gets called for every frame that my quill sketch renders. And the quill renders by default at uh, 60 frames per second. So there are already a couple of um, thousands uh, circles drawn at this position. And I can prove you that by changing the coordinate of my, uh, of my ellipse, re-evaluating my draw method. And then we see that we start drawing um, other circles at the position 100. And uh, yeah, of course I can do this um, all the time, creating many circles. And if I want to have only one of them, I can use uh, Quill's clear method, which will clear my frame before I render anything else. So now only one screen, only one circle is visible all the time. If I quickly evaluate my code, it almost looks like my circle is moving. This is a bit tedious. <laughs> so let's add fun mode in here. And fun mode is the middleware. Funwork is, works pretty similar to Redux, and we can add it by saying middleware fun mode. And fun mode changes how my other functions uh, behave slightly. So my setup function gets an additional job of providing the initial state of my sketch. 
and I will provide the initial state of zero. Whatever is the last thing in my function is the return value of my function. So I will, my setup function is now returning zero, basically. And my draw function gets an additional parameter, which is state. And I can use this state as my x parameter. And if I reevaluate my code, my circle gets drawn at position zero. There's one more method, which is called update. And uh, we will uh, create a, a function which is called update state. Uh, we don't call it update because Clojure already has a function which is called update and we don't want to override it. So we use update state and update state uh, receives a state and then it returns a state. So it's basically working the same way as a reducer does, but it doesn't have an explicit action. And the action that we have in here is our time. So the update, me update method is called for every frame and for every frame a new action is triggered. So we can say uh, state plus one and if we reevaluate this code, the circle starts to move for every frame it's moving to the right uh, by one pixel until it reaches the end of the screen and leaves us forever. But we can create a new function which we call keep in sight, which expects a location. Now we'll learn how an if statement works in closure, parentheses, uh, if. Then we need a function which returns a bool and we say if our location is larger than the width of our sketch. So this is Quill's width method, which uh, returns the current sketch of the, um, the current width of the sketch. Then we say we want to return the location in our y0. And if we wrap our update state function with the keep in sight, and we didn't do any mistake, keep in sight, sorry? Will you repeat? Oh, oh, yes, sure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so now we're getting back to the start. Thank you. Uh, and uh, as soon as we hit the bottom, uh, the, the end, uh, it, get back. it gets back. Just one more small uh, closure trick, which is just a refactoring. We're going to use uh, the thread macro, and the thread macro allows us to provide a value, and then we can add multiple transformations on this value. And the transformation that we want to do is adding one and then keep in sight. So this is just the same code as below here. So we can just remove it and it will work the same. And uh, it improves the read readability a little bit, especially if we're adding more and more functions here, which we will do in the next <coughs> few examples. Um, yeah, so that was Quill. And this is Aristotle. And uh, Aristotle was a Greek philosopher and he lived it around year zero. And he was researching uh, on quite different areas, and one of them was motion. And Aristotle said that if an object is moving, some sort of force is required to keep it moving. Unless that moving thing is being pushed or pulled, it will simply slow down or stop. So that means if I want something to move, for instance, my computer, I need to push it. And if I stop pushing my computer, it won't move anymore. And when we think about our sketch, that's exactly the way that we implemented this. So we're always pushing this plus one, plus one onto our ellipse. And uh, every time we push it, our ellipse will move. And when we would stop it, our ellipse wouldn't move anymore. So we successfully implemented Aristotle motion, motion. And the only problem is that he was totally wrong with that. But uh, thankfully for us, in uh, 1687, Newton came up with his free laws of motion. Does anyone know the three laws of motion from Newton by heart? Or one of them? I know one of them. Action and reaction. Yeah, right, that's object the third one. Object stays in motion unless acted exactly. against the motion. Exactly, perfect. <laughs> very good, very good. And that's the first law of motion. An object at rest stays in rest and an object in motion stays in motion. Um, so the first part is basically the same what Aristotle also said. So if I don't move my computer, it's not moving anymore. But the second part is saying if I push my computer, then it goes on forever into this direction and would never stop. But this is not happening, but this statement is still true. And does someone know how this works? Friction is one part of the solution. So my table has a certain friction. So uh, I need to ha add some uh, force to overcome the friction of my table. <coughs> And the other thing is gravity. So we're sitting on Earth. Earth is a pretty massive planet and pulling everything towards it. And for that reason, my computer stays here. But if I would do the same thing, the, uh, holding the same talk in, in, the, in space, then I could just move my computer forever. Uh, so how can we apply this new knowledge to our sketch? 
So what we basically learned is that a movement is not something that is pushed upon our ellipse, but is something of our ellipse itself. And if we want to model that in our code, we can uh, change our initial state to be a closure map. Closure map is very similar to a plain uh, JavaScript object or just a JSON. So we just define keys, which is location. And we have a location of zero and a velocity of zero. A velocity is just a speed with a direction. We do not have a direction right now, but I added with the next law, so I, alre I already start calling it velocity right here. Uh, now, of course, my state is not a, sing a simple number anymore, so I need to access my location. I can do something which is called destructuring, which you might know if you work with JavaScript. So I can access parts of my closure map in here by using this uh, keys uh, symbol, and I can access my location directly. I will uh, keep my keep inside method as it is, and instead I change how it is called with closures update method, which expects a key I want to change on an object, and then a function which will change this object. So I will just change my location by calling keep inside on it. Uh, now we said that uh, this is uh, the wrong approach of adding a one here, and instead we want to update our location by adding our velocity. And we do not have access to our velocity yet, so let's destructure that as well. Now we lost access to the state thing here, but there's one additional feature in closure uh, destructuring which allows us to uh, get back the initial, it's not completely on the screen, maybe I can increase that a little bit, but now I have access to the whole state object again. Um, yeah, so if we rerun this and we add a velocity maybe to the setup, then once more we didn't change anything, so it was also a pretty boring uh, example, but uh, we are now much more in compliance with the first law of Newton, which we'll need for the second law. Uh, and the second law of motion is that force equals mass times acceleration. This is probably the most important law, and these are quite some words, so let's go through them one by one. Let's start with acceleration. And uh, acceleration just means that we are constantly adding something to our current velocity. And we can do so <coughs> by um, learning one new closure concept, which is how to define local variables. We start with parentheses, then we write let, and then we can provide a list of different variables. First one is our acceleration. Acceleration start with 0 0.01. Uh, the next one is the computation of our new um, velocity. And our new velocity is just our old velocity plus the acceleration. And the third one is our new location, which is our old location plus the new velocity. Now we need to destructure the velocity as well. And uh, we do not need to update our location anymore because we already computed it in the, in the let thing. So we can just associate a new location and the new location is basically the variable new location and we can associate a new velocity, which is new velocity. And if I uh, re-evaluate my code, we see that my circle will get uh, faster and faster, or it slowly gets faster and faster, and we can also uh, let it get <coughs> deaccelerated so that it's not becoming too fast and uh, annoying, and at any point we can also decide to stop accelerating it, so now it will continue with constant speed. So we added acceleration to our circle. Uh, how about mass? So the cool thing if you're programming with physics is that if you, you can at any time decide that you want to change physics to make things easier. And in our case, we'll just decide that everything in our world will have mass one. And if everything has mass one, then our equation changes to force equals one times acceleration and force equals acceleration. Uh, if we wanted to um, implement mass, we could basically add a mass to every circle and the larger our circle is, the stronger is the force which is work working upon it. But we just ignore it and uh, we focus on the force. And uh, I have a second definition of force, which is pretty similar. Uh, force is a vector that causes an object with mass to accelerate. We already learned about acceleration. We learned that we want to ignore mass. And the new thing is that force is a vector. And uh, a vector is basically just something which has an x and a y part. And you can uh, create a vector in uh, closure with uh, square brackets, 
And now we say that our location starts at position 0, 0. Our velocity is 0, 0. And our acceleration is uh, maybe 0 0.01 and 0 0.01. Now, velocity, acceleration, and location are not simple numbers anymore. So we can't just add them. But we can use uh, vector addition in order to add them. So I added a function which can do vector addition. And vector addition just means we are adding the x part and the y part separately. Uh, so if I rerun the sketch, then oh, I think I did a mistake. Set up. I just get to my uh, backup solution, <laughs> copying over from the next example. Oh yeah, that's right. That's right. We don't need to keep inside anymore. Thank you. And the draw function needs to change uh, in its structuring. Uh, we do not want to destructure location um, directly from uh, directly, but we know that location is a vector which has an x and a y part. So we can uh, use the x and a y part as x and y values of the ellipse. Now, if we rerun the sketch, our circle will move to the right and to the bottom because these are the two forces we uh, added on them. Maybe we can revert them and hope that our uh, ellipse will come back at some time. And uh, in the meantime, uh, let's learn about uh, force accumulation. Uh, force accumulation just means that we are adding different forces together in order to create a new one. So for instance, we have a wind force which says I want to move my circle to the right and we have uh, and, and I don't want to move it up or oh, there it was and I don't want to move it uh, up or down and uh, we have a gravity which is moving my circle not to the left or to the right but to the bottom and in my acceleration I can just combine these forces so I can just say add wind and gravity and with that way, I can just combine arbitrary forces together in order to create, um, yeah, to create uh, the forces that I want to create. And uh, yeah, that was the second law of motion. So we learned that force equals mass times acceleration. And uh, we added acceleration to our lips. We ignored mass. And we changed all the, vector, all the forces to be vectors. We do the same trick with the third law of Newton that we did with mass. So we just ignore it. And uh, we go straight to particle systems. Uh, so right now, we still have only this one uh, circle. And uh, with particle systems, this will change. Particle systems were invented in 1982 by the movie Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Uh, I'm not a Trekkie, so I've never seen the movie. But I was able to get a picture of the first particle system that was ever created. I think that the planet is exploding or something. Maybe we have a Trekkie here who knows that. Um, but I th what I think what is really cool about that is that they even created a scientific paper about particle systems due to the movie. And this really shows the dedication when you're creating a movie and then you create also a paper because you invented particle systems uh, on the way there. And uh, particle systems consist of two parts. The first one is, of course, a particle with a certain behavior. And um, uh, you can do something like provide an initial velocity to your particle. You can provide a lifespan to your particle, so your particle will uh, die at some point, or change the color of your particle. And uh, let's, let's uh, try this with our circle. Um, so uh, let's start by adding a lifespan to our circle. So we'll add an initial lifespan of 255. And for every state change, we will update the lifespan by decreasing it. So now we have, we, we start with 255 and we decrease while our program continues. Um, what well we can, maybe let's just for a moment uh, remove uh, the velocity and the location, uh, the, the velocity so our circle is not moving anymore, and reevaluate the sketch. Let's maybe uh, improve the position of our circle. So our fire should probably start in the middle of the screen, so I'm just dividing the width of my canvas with two, and uh, on the bottom. So if we reevaluate that and we type things correctly, 
Dann we Ah, here we go. We should see our ellipse uh, on the or a particle on the right position. Now we can use Quill's fill method in order to change the color of the ellipse. So the first parameter that it expects is a red value. So we provide 255 and 00, 0 for green and blue, and then we have a red ellipse. Or uh, red and green, uh, and then we have a yellow ellipse. Or if we use all four of them, we have a white one. Uh, the fourth parameter is the alpha value of the, uh, of the color. So we can use our lifespan here. We just destructure the lifespan once more. And if we apply it here, our circle disappears because our lifespan is already at zero. But if we restart this program, our circle will slowly start to disappear. And we can play around with physics once more and add a negative gravity and our circle will start to move upwards. Um, maybe let's also add a little bit of wind to it, just a random value between minus 0 0.05 and plus 0 0.05. And now our ellipse starts to wiggle slightly to the left and to the right and is moving up, quite similar as a fire would do. Um, yeah, let's go to the uh, next part, because we finished with our particle with a behavior which is the particle emitter. So we have everything in place to draw one particle on the screen, but what we actually want to do is having multiple particles. And what we can just do is to change every function that we have so far and say it's a particle function. So we have a setup particle function, we have a draw particle function, and an update particle function. Uh, now we need a new setup function, which uh, will provide our initial state, and our initial state is an empty list where we will add all the particles, and an empty list enclosure is written with parentheses. Uh, now we need a new draw method, and our draw method will get all the particles. We use closes do sec method, which is the same as JavaScript's for each method, and we say that we want to do something with every particle. Then we create an iterator variable, and we call it particle and for all the particles we want to draw them. Draw particle, particle. And the last thing is our new uh, update method or update state, which receives all the particles. Then it creates one more new particle. We can do this with conch, which is just uh, append. And we want to append to all the particles a new particle, which we create by calling setup particle. And after that, we want to map over all our particles with our update method. Yeah, and if we re-evaluate this, we'll see that we still have only one particle. And the reason is that we have this clear method here in the draw particle method, which is always clearing our frame. But if we remove it and maybe add it to the draw method so that we clear after every frame, things start to look like uh, fire a little bit. The only thing which is bad in here uh, is the color. And uh, the color is uh, the next thing which we're going to fix. Yeah. In the last part, which is additive blending. And additive blending basically means how your um, colors behave when they overlap. So uh, you can, <coughs> when, you, when you're maybe you're web developers and you know Z-index, where you can just define that some things are above other things. And if you're working with graphics, you can do something additional, and you can define that if something overlaps, then let's just blend it together. And additive blending means that if it overlaps, makes it make it brighter. So if all three colors overlap, we get a white color. And this is exactly what we need for our fire, because in the middle, where all the particles are, things should be really light. And when a particle reach the end of our fire, they should get back to their normal non-blended color. Uh, all we have to do in order to add blending to our particle system is in the setup method to call blend mode add. And if we do that, things still look pretty boring because we are blending white on white, which gives us more white. But if we instead blend red, a little bit of green, and no blue, then we get something which looks much more like fire. 
because in here um, the red and the green are overlapping, creating yellow. And when I get to the outside, they're back to red. We can even add a little bit of blue to it. And then we have a white center in here and maybe some more yellow so that we have a brighter yellow uh, for our fire. Uh, so this is exactly the fire you've seen uh, in the start thing. It's just uh, consisting of circles, Newton's laws of motion, particle systems and additive blending. But of course, this is just the beginning. And from here on, you can start creating your own fires and discover your own fires. And you can do something like uh, creating fires which follow your mouse. So in this example, the mouse is basically the wind which we create. And wherever the uh, mouse pointer is, there's the wind. Um, you can use the lifespan to not only change um, the opacity of your circle, but also to make the circle smaller. So things look a little bit more like a, a flame in the end. Uh, instead of plain circles, you can also use uh, images of circles with gradient colors uh, in order to create something which is a more realistic uh, fire, I think. Or if you try to ignore physics once more, you can just create rainbow, color, rainbow fires uh, and uh, match all the colors together. Uh, so if you, if you want to uh, take a look once more at the slides, I uh, provided them under this URL, but I will also post them to the uh, group here and uh, if you want to share your fire with me I would be very happy if you would if you would start to creating some fires together thank you So I, I say, let's say the hello world or yeah. something similar. Um, I created a little app for, uh, for was just for myself for shopping. So I have the problem that I need my shopping list to be in the same order as the supermarket. Otherwise, I get uh, crazy. So everything has to be in the same order. And with this closure script app, you can just add what you want on your um, what you want to shop, and then it gets sorted like my supermarket around the corner, which is really really helpful for my life. Yeah, it's a web application. I mean, you are also able to work with React Native with Clojure. So uh, you can, I mean, you can just compile Clojure script into JavaScript and then call the uh, React Native um, functions. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, also the, the cool thing is that you're not only um, in the JavaScript world, so you can also compile to Java. So you can use the same code for an, in order to create a Java server or a JavaScript frontend. Yeah, so uh, oh, not in this one, I mean in the, in the shopping app, <laughs> sorry, I was. but uh, in general, the uh, Clojure community is embracing React quite much, so almost uh, every uh, UI library there is a thin wrapper around React or working like React, and uh, I think a lot of ideas also from the React community are rooted in the uh, Clojure script um, community, something like Reframe, which is basically the same as Redux, but a couple of years before that. And uh, yeah, so but uh, React and uh, Clojure script uh, fit really well together. Yeah. Uh, would you be able to compare the experience of working with like traditional React and uh, React in Clojure script? Like um, so for me, uh, the, the main difference is that working with Clojure script really feels like working with a language that was designed and not that happened, like with JavaScript. So in JavaScript, there were a lot of different features which never work together and you have some really weird um, co type coercions in there because of this. And uh, in, in Clojure Script, you have a really huge um, core library, something like uh, Lodash or Ramda are in JavaScript, but it is part of the core. And um, yeah, and there's like more than one common approach that everyone uses in order to create them. So I, I don't think there's any much uh, of a difference with regards to how we work with React. So it's I mean, you create components and you can create states, so this is pretty similar. And if you're using Reframe, it's just like using uh, Redux. Uh, but I think it's a huge difference when you, uh, when you use a language where, yeah, where, where, where you notice that it was designed. And you can plug and play any JavaScript framework into it also. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So you can just access, so everything I did here uh, is compiled into ClojureScript. 
uh, into JavaScript, sorry, <laughs> and, uh, and then you can get access to JavaScript libraries. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah. So do you know any like, really big complex web applications written in, in ClojureScript? Um, so there was an editor, I'm not sure if it was work written in ClojureScript as well, which was Lighttable. I think it was uh, closed a couple of years ago, so I don't think it's actively uh, working on anymore, but it was for a long time like the largest uh, closure or closure script application. I'm not, I think it was both, so I think they had also a web version. Um, but other than that, I mean, there's basically uh, almost all big companies have some small closure project, but they're not that many really large. Uh, so there's not like Facebook and React, so there's not something like that. Uh, what do you mean exactly in the beginning? Ah, yeah, yeah. It was not yeah, yeah. That, yeah, that that explanation is a bit complex, <laughs> but um, basically the def sketch uh, function is not a function, uh, but it's actually a macro. And uh, in Clojure, you have some built-in capabilities to rewrite your language. So this is uh, not, it, it is quite rarely used. It is usually only used to make an API a bit more easier to use. Exactly that was the case with the dev sketch method. Um, but the, uh, the code I wrote is later uh, translated into a string, but I don't have to do it myself because I have a macro that uh, does the job for me. Yeah. Could you re-explain the error macro? I, I didn't, didn't okay, yeah. Okay, so. Uh, when you this uh, this one is called it's also a macro it's called the threading uh, the thread macro, and you specify some uh, value in here. In our case, it's our state, and our initial state here was an empty list, or no, that was the particle. Sorry, that is the particle one, and our particle is just this object here. So an object uh, consisting of uh, a location, a velocity, and a lifespan. And after that, I can. Uh, add multiple functions which uh, work with this particle. And what uh, Clojure does behind the curtains is basically adding state everywhere here. So for all these functions, the second parameter is the object that it should uh, change. And it's also uh, nesting them so that they build upon each other. So you are basically doing something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's just a function. It's just another way to write it. Yeah. 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 Where was defined the update rate? Here you have the function update and. Yeah, that's a part of Closure Core. So that's uh, so there are some core functions which you can uh, just access. Same with the associ function. Uh, there's a quill method for that, so you can do something in the setup function usually, which is frame rate, and then you can change it to whatever you want. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 60, I think. Okay. Yeah. And this is ba this is the same API as processing, so uh, this uh, you can basically convert this one to one into a Java program, which will just use the same function names and the same parameters. And also with JavaScript. Yeah. yeah. Is there any reason why you would consider moving back to traditional JavaScript from after using JavaScript? Well, there are more jobs there. <laughs> <laughs> I think. <laughs> I think that's the only one. So I mean, it's it's always hard to sell uh, on on for business people. So we want to do this really exotic programming language. You will find no other developers who will know about that. Uh, do you want to start a project with that? Maybe. And yeah, this is, this is a quite a hard sell. So uh, yeah, this is currently my main reason, but I hope this will change in the future. I was in a situation where the project was written in ClojureScript, then the developer left, and no one could maintain it. Yeah. So we started writing it back into React. Yeah, yeah. 
How do you deal with exceptions? Is there something like a maybe data type or something? There are also um, all these algorithmic data types like maybes, um, but they're not that commonly used in, in the uh, closure world or in the closure community. So the closure community has uh, quite a, um, yeah, a pragmatic approach to programming, so they do whatever is uh, the, si the simplest one. And uh, you have also a normal try-catch, so I'm not, I don't know it by heart, but I would bet it's written like that somehow. Um, uh, but you can do both. So the, you have a library which is called Algo Monads, and then you can get all the standard monads that you know. Yeah. Yep. Oh, closure spec. <laughs> I think it's cool, but I haven't learned enough about it to uh, to have an opinion about <laughs> it. But uh, I will try to do it in the next couple of months. But I, I everyone says it's cool, so I think it's cool as well. But I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, next meetup is about spec. <laughs> yeah, that's all. Thanks yeah. again, Thomas. Yeah, thanks really also cool. for Muse for for this cool venue. Thanks. <laughs> so I'm I'm gonna use a little cheesy pun, but I was discovering fire the whole whole event. So let's cool it down with some beer and some uh, cold drinks. Uh, so, I think we can go upstairs, so you can follow everyone in the news t-shirts who will bring you to the sixth floor either with the lift or with the, with the stairs. And maybe just bring as much beer as you can take in your hands and as much pizza as you can take in your hand, and so that we, we all have what to drink and eat. We can continue discussions. Alright, thanks again. And thanks for coming. <laughs>